The last test until next summer. Will it be a career-defining match for Alex Carey? We swap in one former Aussie skipper with another. Tim Payne joins the Around the Wicket team. Ross Taylor is back for more and Simon Cadditch gives us his IPL edition of the short staff. Let's go Around the Wicket. Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of Around the Wicket and we've got a brand new cast for you. Simon Cadditch joins us for the very first time, former Aussie test opener and also former Aussie skipper Tim Payne joins the Around the Wicket team as we look ahead to the second test between Australia and New Zealand. Gentlemen, great to have you on board. Before we get stuck into that second test though, I reckon we need to talk about England up against India. The final test is going to start this evening and Ben Stokes has come out and said, hey, we haven't been pushovers like some of the others that have toured India in recent times. What did you make of those comments, Kat? Well, it sounded like a, a thinly veiled sledge, didn't it? <laughs> I mean, you can't fault Ben Stokes because he's been magnificent tactically in this series. I mean, England have got a very young spin attack in tough conditions in the subcontinent. But young Rehan Ahmed, Tom Hartley and Shah Bashir have been fantastic and Ben Stokes deserves a lot of credit for that. But <laughs> he has been playing against the Indian B team because there's been no Kohli, no Shami. Boomer got rested last test, KL Rahul's out and Rishabh Pant's obviously still making his way back from that horrific accident. So they're not their strongest team but it just goes to show the depth in Indian cricket is huge because there's some big names coming into this next era of Indian cricket. Jace Wells leading the charge. Young Jarrell was magnificent in that last test as well. So uh, India looking very strong. A scary proposition for world cricket. Geez, that was a big butt, wasn't it, Tim Payne? What do you think about that Indian yeah, B team? Tim, uh, yeah, I think Kato's absolutely nailed it, to be honest. I think I totally agree with him. And I know what it's like to be beaten by an Indian B side. Unfortunately, <laughs> it happened to us in our home soil. Um, but, yeah, some huge names out for India, which has certainly helped the English Um but as well, as, as Kato said, I, I thoroughly enjoy watching England play the game now. I love the way they're going about it. Um, I love watching them lose, don't get me wrong, but they are entertaining, they're exciting, uh, and they have been good for, for Test cricket. Kat, how do you think this last Test is going to go then? They get towards the end of the tour. Yeah, it's never easy in the subcontinent, long tour, and I think when you get closer to that finish line, if you don't have the experience heads around to guide the young guys to say, don't check out early because you can easily have one step, one foot on the plane before you've finished the test match. And that's the danger for some of these young England players that are making their way in test cricket that they've already checked out mentally because it has been a tough tour for them. They're 3-1 down. They'll want to finish strongly. But I don't think India will allow that to happen. I think India will finish off winning at 4-1. Jeezy started strongly on around the wicket, has Simon Cadditch. Tim Payne, I hear that you're also a bit fired up. Ben Stokes has had plenty to say about DRS and whether or not we should eliminate the umpire's call. What do you think about yep. DRS more broadly? Yeah, I've just about had enough of it, Nez, to be honest. I think the way I look at it is I keep going back to why did we bring DRS into the game of cricket? It was to, to take out the absolute howler, the absolute stinker. And for me, what I'm seeing now is literally every single batsman that gets given out LBW is referring it. Um, you know, every so many times guys know they're out or they know they've hit the ball, uh, they refer it or vice versa. And it's just taking up too much time in the game. Uh, I, I love the fact that in our game that sometimes with the umpires, we can leave it up to a bit of human error. That's what we want. If we don't want umpires out there, then let's just have DRS for everything because that's what it feels like to me at the moment. It was brought in for the howler. It was brought in to, to eradicate the absolute stinking decision. And for me, it's just taken on way too much now. We see far too much. I agree. Umpires call and all that stuff. It's way too much of it's being talked about DRS and not batting, bowling, fielding and the skills of cricket. So I think the only way to fix it for me is to take it back to one referral for each team, each innings, and then maybe the players on the field will use it more sparingly. Whereas at the moment, it's like, we'll just take a chance and we might get an umpire's call or we might not. But I think it's just it's taken on a world of its own DRS and we need to rein it back in a little bit. I love the fact that mostly cricketers say to people like me, you've never been out there in the middle and now it's that you guys are retired and you're actually watching it a lot more and you're going, geez, it takes too long. Geez, these are the things that I want to fix about it. What do you reckon? Should it go back to one referral? And by the way, Payne had a few issues with the DRS along the way with his <laughs> test career as well. I'll just throw in there as a drive-by. Look, that's not a drive-by. Shane Watson had the most... <laughs> Issues with it, yeah. and, and 
speaking from experience, he got one wrong with me at the other <laughs> end at the Gabba. And he said, no, no, don't refer it, you're out. And I was like reluctant to do it, did it, and then found out that I wasn't out. So what I got that one wrong as well, and it wasn't even him involved. But I agree with Payne. I think uh, it has gotten overboard. Um, and I think the other part of it is you can get two different decisions based on what the actual umpire's decision is. So if it is an umpire's call and it's being given out, you know, obviously then when the referral comes through, the, the bowling team can get it back if it's an umpire's call. So there's these... So you know, inconsistencies with it, and it's it is taking a lot of time out of the game. Just quietly as we head to the break, though, um, you've had a few nightmares about those sort of situations, haven't you, Kurt? Well, <laughs> listening to Ross Taylor the other day talk about PTSD with runouts, that was one of the things that sprung to mind. Waking up in the middle of the night, being smoked by Shane Watson, my last test, getting a <laughs> diamond duck, first time ever in the career. So. Every now and then you have those dreams. The worst ones are when you get the nick and you go for a catch and nearly knock your wife out next to you in bed (laughs) when the elbow goes flying across the bed. (laughs) Payne, you had any nightmares along your way? No, well, I do. DRS we've touched on. Um, My mind often shoots back to Headingley, obviously. We made an absolute meal of of that test match with DRS. Uh, We wasted one and I think pitched about two sets of stumps outside leg uh, at one stage. But again, I think because... There's so much going on and you think, oh, maybe it might be pitching just in line and is it 50% of the ball? Is it less? It's more. And you just end up making bad decisions. But, um, yeah, and even run-outs, Kato, talking about Watto. Watto rang me out in my – well, my first one-day international was actually against Scotland at the Grange, but my first big one-day international was a few days later in England uh, at the Oval and and Watto ran me out for a duck there in the first (laughs) over as well, so we've got that in common. (laughs) <laughs> Poor old Shane Watson. He does come a lot at these uh, types of shows and sportsmen's nights. Stick with us, though, Pony, because we're really going to hone in on that second test shortly. This is Around the Wicket. Don't go anywhere. A hugely important test coming up for both Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand looking for a long-awaited win up against their arch rivals. Australia hoping to sweep the series. And also for the Aussies, it's the last test they play until India tour Australia next summer. So a chance for a few players to try and get a few things right. So I'm putting our debutants on around the wicket on the spot. The three things that they each think will define this second test with that little glimpse to the future of next summer as well. Now, Payne, you both have decided that Nathan Lyon is the key factor here, number one, which is fair enough given he's coming off that 10-wicket performance. You skippered him so much in Test cricket. Can you just give us an insight into what it's like to have such a reliable performer test in, test out? Yeah, I think Pat Cummins touched on it after the last Test match. It is a, He's a captain's dream. I mean, you can get off to a great start with, with the big quicks that Australia have always been blessed with and um, and fortunately the last kind of couple of decades in Australian cricket we've either had Nathan Lyon or, or Shane Warne so um, many Australian captains have had the luxury of a great spinner and, and Pat's now a beneficiary of it as well and um, you know Nathan Lyon seems to be after his little uh, calf niggle in England seems to be getting better with age. Uh, I read somewhere the other day he's taken his last 100 wickets have come in 20 tests at about an average of 18 which is extraordinary. Uh, and I know his average against New Zealand, I think in 11 or 12 tests, is about 18. So he's troubled them in New Zealand. He's troubled them in Australia. Um, and I think, again, with the the around the wicket sort of line that he's bowling to them with a short leg and leg slip where Steve Smith and Travis Head have been right in the game in the first test, I think that'll continue. And New Zealand will have to find a way of playing him and scoring off him. Otherwise, he's going to have a huge say on this test match as well. How do the Kiwis quell his influence? It's not easy because he's so strong with hitting at that consistent length from either around the wicket or over the wicket, as Payne mentioned uh, there with the leg slip in play. Um, he's so strong at that length. So I think what the Kiwis need to do, and, and a lot of players are reluctant to do it, is use their feet, get down the wicket. And I'm not saying do it every ball, but it's something that potentially has to happen to throw him off that length. The other part of it is positioning themselves on the crease laterally so they can't allow him to spin the ball into that leg slip, which he does so often. So whether they have to try and open up the offside more and, and play against the spin, but that has to happen within their individual games. And, and obviously, you know, holding out to deep mid-wicket and deep mid-on is an ideal, you know, when you've got a couple back. So that's something they have to think about. Are they going to wear him down a bit more and play the percentages and work ones and try and rotate strike a bit more against him? Kat, your second defining factor of this test is Kiwi regrets and how they rectify them. Tell me more. 
Well, obviously, Ross Taylor alluded to the other day with, uh, obviously, Neil Wagner. That would be a re regret, the fact that, you know, he didn't play that first test because you look at the way the Australian tail, particularly Josh Hazelwood and Cameron Green, finished off that first innings for Australia where it looked like they might only get 250. That was something that was a huge swing in the game. So, you know, Wagner wouldn't have allowed that to happen. He would have been aggressive to Hazelwood and probably even to Cameron Green. So there's that scenario. Um, you know, whether they thought another spinner comes into play because it did spin. Uh, Glenn Phillips took five in the second innings. He was magnificent. He's not a, a frontline spinner, but he did a very good job. So that's something they'll have to look at. But I think the big thing is their batting. You know, how they're going to get a decent first innings total against this Australian attack, which is the best in the world in Test cricket. On that very point, Payne Kane Williamson, he had a rough time of it in that first test. He's going to play his 100th test, and we'll talk more about that to Ross Taylor shortly. But he's key in this one, no doubt about it. Yeah, I think he is. He is the key. There's no doubt about that. Cato talked there about getting that score to 350, around 200, 250 in the first innings. And I think the difference in that is, is Kane Williamson. I, I don't think the Kiwis have won a lot of tests in the last decade without him scoring hundreds or two hundreds. Um, there's been a little bit of talk around him also. I've, I've seen a lot more on social media in the last few months around his record against Australia, um, against India and against England. And I think that's something that will probably be irking him a little bit. So um, I think he'll have a point to prove in this test match. And if he does play well, then he puts certainly puts New Zealand in the frame. They weren't too far off, barring a you know a last wicket partnership, last test match. Um, but yeah, I think he's absolutely their key. He's their one absolute world-class player. And if he can get a big hundred, um, they can compete with anyone. Their third defining factor for you, Kat, is, as we said, looking a little bit ahead as well, not just this test match, Cameron Green and his form and the decisions that he's making at the moment around his career. Yeah, look, I think, uh, you know, that 170 or not out in the first innings was class because it was tough conditions. The Kiwis were in their home deck. They were doing well. Australia were under pressure. He was under pressure for his spot. There's been a lot of talk about his position at number four in this test team. But the way he responded, I think the, the way that he managed the tempo of his innings was something that was probably the most pleasing thing for a 24-year-old. He's played that role beautifully for WA over a number of years in the Sheffield Shield, averaging over 60. So it was great to see him do that, and that'll give him a huge amount of confidence now moving forward. He played Shield cricket, uh, leading in for WA, got a good 100 in the second innings, I think, down in Tassie. And he's going to prioritise that in terms of later this year when India come for five tests. So I think that's, you know, that's something that's really pleasing to see, that the hierarchy and he himself realised that you know, his preparation leading to the Ashes wasn't great. He went to the IPL. Can't blame him for that. There was a $3 million payday there. But... It, it impacted his ability to do well in the Ashes, in particular with the bat, because England's not an easy place to just walk in and play after you've been whacking a white ball around for two months. And it proves that you can have Marsh and Green in the same 11. And as we both know, Simon Kadditch, too many West Aussies, never enough. <laughs> Payne, uh, your final defining factor once again is a little bit looking forward to next summer. And you think that this could be a career-defining test, potentially, for the likes of Marnus Labashain and Alex Carey? Yeah, I don't know if it'll be career-defining, but it's certainly a defining moment in their career, I think, given the, the long layoff. But, yeah, certainly for me, Marnus Labashain and Alex Carey, they're, they're the two guys in the Australian lineup who are under pressure. I guess Marnus has had a, a lean run for um, his last 35 test innings, I think. And um, my experience with Marnus is he, he's a guy who likes to tinker with his technique. He's a really deep thinker about the way he wants to bat. Uh, but what he's normally really good at is leaving that at training and then walking out to the middle game day and, and playing really instinctively and with, with really high energy and looking to score. And I think what it looks like to me is he's, he's thinking a lot about his batting when he's actually in the middle rather than just a training in the net. So hopefully we see him come out with a really clear mind. I think he was one off 27 or 30 balls in the last test match. And that's very unlike Manus. Normally he just comes out, as I said, really instinctively looks to score and puts the bowlers back under pressure. Not so much with, hitting lots of boundaries, but just by being able to tick the scoreboard over, similar to a, a Michael Hussey in his in his prime. And then Alex Carey, uh, I think his wicket-keeping in the last sort of 12 months has been outstanding. He keeps getting better every series, uh, but his batting has, has dropped off a little bit. And um, again, to me, he looks like a guy who's just in a little bit of a rush, uh, trying to get off to a flyer a little bit too much. Uh, I'd like to see him in this test come out, trust his defence a little bit more, take his time and build his innings because as we've seen with Alex over his career with South Australia and Australia, he's, a, he's a naturally a really fast scorer um, if he just spends time at the wicket. So hopefully he gives himself 
the chance to do that. And um, I'm backing them both in to have a big test match if they do that. Kat, putting you on the spot off the back of that, do you think Alex Carey will be the test keeper come next summer? It's a tough one because he's got Josh Inglis breathing down his neck and we've seen what Josh Inglis did in the World Cup for Australia and in white ball cricket. He got a fantastic 100 off about 50 balls in the T20s in India uh, late last year and he's just come off a shield 100 for WA against Queensland at the Wacker. So he's a very good young prospect and it's a good, healthy competition. But I think at this stage, Alex Carey, you know, his keeping's been magnificent, as Payne said. But I think the biggest issue is if the top order aren't making runs like they have in recent times, as we saw against Pakistan and the West Indies, then the Indians will expose that. And then Alex Carey needs to make runs batting at seven because there'll be a time where Australia need runs out of him to, to win a test match. And I think this year he's averaging under 24 in the last sort of 12 months. So that's below his standard. He's better than that. Uh, and when he gets going, as Payne said... He's a beautiful ball striker and he scores as quickly as anyone. So I agree. I think he just needs to give himself that time to settle, earn the right to play cover drives on the up and, and you know throw his hands at with balls. But once he's done that time in the first sort of 20 or 30 balls, not in his first 10. We're running out of time here, Payne, but I want to ask you the same question. Do you think he's going to be the test keeper next summer, Alex Carey? Uh, yeah, it's, again, hard to say. I, think I agree. Josh Inglis is a superb talent. He's doing everything right. Uh, I think the one thing that's in Alex Kerr's favour at the moment is that he is the man in that position. So it's it's in his hands. He goes out and performs well in this test match. Uh, he'll get a good run in with South Australia next summer into the Indian series. So uh, possession of the job is, is a really positive thing for Alex Kerr at the moment. And as I said, I think if he gives himself the chance... Early in his innings, uh, in the next few days, I'm sure he'll cash in and score a big one and, and that spot will be him his come next summer. Well, Payne, we've sent your performance over this show to the decision review system and it's come back <laughs> that you can stay on around the wicket. So thank you very much for joining us for your debut and I'm sure you'll be back for another episode shortly. Don't go anywhere because Ross Taylor is back. He dropped a few truth bombs the other day. I wonder what we've got in store today. I can see the world inviting me in But I can't change cause I was born with it built in I was born different Yes, I'm proud to be that way Yes, I'm proud An incredibly special test coming up for both Kane Williamson and Tim Southey. Joining us to talk more about it is Ross No Sugar Coating It Taylor is his new name. <laughs> Roscoe, before we get on to those milestones, I hear your phone's been a bit busy in the last 48 hours. Yeah, I thought I'd scored 100 uh, <laughs> the way that it's been, um, been, been going off. Um, I didn't know so many journalists had my number, but uh, no, nah, all, all good fun. Let's talk about Kane Williamson, shall we? He's one of the greatest we've ever seen. Aaron Finch a, a few shows ago said that he's even underrated in the way that we don't truly appreciate his genius. You spent a lot of time out there in the middle with him. Can you tell us what makes him just so special? Yeah, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to to watch him bat for a long period of time and be at the other end. I uh, had a pretty good seat um, to, to watch him develop. Uh, in those early years, I think, he sort of strived for perfection, and once he worked out that perfection doesn't really uh, is not attainable. But um, yeah, I think the way he went about his cricket, um, the way he trains, uh, his professionalism, uh, and I guess the confidence that he he bestows upon the group um, and all the other players uh, around the world, um, the way they probably scout him and try to to try and get him out. I think um, you know. New Zealand, we've only had a, a limited amount of really world-class batters, um, but to have him play for so long, uh, you know, it's a it's a special achievement. It's the way that he continues to do what he does in all conditions, and and as I say, the other week there was also this the discussion of how many more hundreds he would have had if he bat more often on Australian pitches. As you say, he brings so much to a team. Was he kind of born to bat in many ways? Oh, very much so. I think, um, you know, you, you hear the stories of him as a, you know, he was scoring hundreds as 10, 11-year-old. Um, I think the biggest thing for me 
that the biggest honour I could give Kane is if I needed anyone to bat for my life, uh, he would be first on the list. Um, you know, 32 hundreds. Um, you know, he's up there. I think he's got the most, the third most runs um, after after 99 games. I think Steve Smith and Brian Lara are the only ones ahead of him. I think, you know, when you're starting to talk those type of numbers with those type of players, um, and I'm very special for, for a player of that calibre to, to be to be a Kiwi. Uh, it's probably a little bit like our, our rugby. We, we love our rugby players and the Aussies, you know, we're not we're not that phased by Aussie rugby players, but it's it's sort of in a little bit different the other way. So um, it's good to, to see that he's finally probably getting the recognition um, that he's getting, but uh, he's been a, a stalwart for us for, for a number of years. Who'd bat for your life, Count? I wouldn't go past Kane Williamson. I mean, I, I think Steve Smith being biased as an Australian at the height of his powers back in 2019 in that Ashes series, you'd say he was Bradman-esque and you'd want him batting for your life. I mean, obviously, Steve Waugh back in the day, but Kane Williamson's right up there. I mean, average of 55 in test cricket, 32 test hundreds. He's a quiet achiever, very humble man, and I've loved watching him go about his business in all formats. He's a... He's a very adaptable player. He's not only been a great test batsman, but at times in the IPL, he's been a wonderful IPL player as well in T20. And quite special that he'll play his 100th test alongside the captain, Tim Southey, who will also play his 100th test. Very different characters off the field, Ross, but have you got a Tim Southey story for us? Well, I think that, yeah, as you said, I think they've both been amazing for New Zealand cricket. And to go on what Kato said, um, it's not just 100 Test matches, it's how they've played over the 2020 uh, and one day they've had fantastic careers. Uh, Tim's um, going to be the first player to play, um, first fast bowler to play 100 uh, matches in all formats. Um, I was fortunate enough to be there in, all, in both of their debuts. Uh, Kane to get 100, Tim got a fantastic fifer and I think to this day is still his top score in that first game. And, you know, he's only 18 or 19 um, to still be going, uh, you know, after this amount of time, I think, um, you know, it's a testament to uh, the fitness and the way he goes about it. But um, any time you play, about to play 100 tests, it's, it's not only about um, yourself as a player. I think it's also um, a thank you to your families. And I think, you know, both of those two uh, have got rocks behind. You know, their families have been a, a, a big pillar in their careers. And I'm sure it's a, a, a special day and a special um, celebration for them as well. It's a bit of a shame that Tim Sowley's not at his best at the moment as he's going into this. Do you think he's under a bit of pressure, Kat? Oh, he's under some pressure. I mean, he's only got four wickets at about 80 in 2024. So he's had a tough start against South Africa first and now in this first test against Australia. And I think winning the toss as skipper, putting Australia in on a green base and reserve the other day and not being able to knock them over for under 300 was a, you know, a huge challenge. And I think you only had to look at the game and see the pressure levels drop because when Henry and O'Rourke had the ball, at times it looked like Australia were under huge pressure. As soon as Southie got the ball, it was a different kettle of fish. And two wickets in that test match in conducive conditions, he'll be disappointed with that. He's been a wonderful servant of New Zealand cricket and it's a remarkable achievement to be playing his 100th test. But at 35, it'll be interesting given that they've just, obviously, the news with Wagner retiring and whether it's forced or not, Ross, you know better than me, but um, I won't go there. But in terms of... Tim Southey, there'll be some tough conversations because as skipper, he's got to be able to look his players in the eye and be able to go out there and do the job. And in that first test, he found it tough. Ross Taylor, thank you so much for being a part of the show once more. A really special test coming up for New Zealand. Hoping for you that maybe you managed to draw the series, but obviously a couple of Aussies are sitting here. We'll chat to you after the test. Great stuff. A busy week for Ross Taylor. Don't go anywhere. We've got a special IPL edition of the short stuff. to make your debut in the short stuff for Simon Kadic and we've got a special IPL edition because of course you used to be a coach at RCB you've coached if you're at Coley so the first question is how's he going to go in the IPL after an extended layoff well out of all the players I've either played against uh, or with or coached he without doubt has the most energy of anyone I've ever seen and that's saying something because played with Mike Hussey and Justin Langer and Brad Hogg and these sorts of guys but in terms of coaching no issues. I think he'll be rejuvenated after the break with his family and uh, come back firing. Which Aussie is going to have the biggest impact this IPL? 
Well, the man who's in career best form, Glenn Maxwell. Love it. How will Mumbai go under the captaincy of Hardik Pandya? It's been a bit controversial with Rohit Sharma moving aside. Look, it's a massive in for Mumbai, getting Hardik Pandya back. And they didn't have Boomer last year. He was injured. So they'll be the team to beat. But I think that dynamic will be interesting. But it might free up Rohit Sharma to go out there and you know be at his blazing best at the top of the order. And I think that's something that they'll, uh, they'll love having because he's a, a quality player. He's one of the huge storylines, Hardik Pandya, returning to Mumbai. But what is going to be the biggest storyline this IPL? There are plenty of them. There are plenty. I mean, every year there's always the talk about MS Dhoni retiring. So I think that one will probably rear its head, no doubt. And can Chennai win it if it is his last year? And they'll be a big chance, given their quality. But for me, I think the heartwarming story is Richard Punt coming back on the cricket field and, and playing for Delhi after what he's gone through with that horrific car accident. We've both spent a lot of time in India. Tell us how big a moment will that be for Aussie viewers who may not understand? Look, it's huge because I think he's an Indian superstar. We saw that when he came to Australia in that test series a couple of years ago. He was outstanding in that sort of lower order role, putting pressure on the Australian quicks. But in India, I guess the, the fact is he's leader of Delhi. He missed last season with the, the knee injury. And obviously, um, you know, his aggressive style of play is what Delhi lacked last year, particularly in that middle order at their home venue. And Indian crowds love him. He plays the, the, the way, you know, they love to see. Aggressive and, and lots of sixes. And little chirps with babysitting with Tim Payne as well. <laughs> Can Captain Cummins come good? Yes, he's a great captain, but in T20, it hasn't necessarily been his form and Sunrisers have gone with him. Well, can he overcome the SRH captaincy curse? Because a couple of years ago, David Warner had it. Then he got resold. Then in comes Kane Williamson, who was retained. He lasted a year. He's gone. Then in came Aidan Markram for the last two years. He's had great success with SRH in SA. I'm resoling you. We'll see you next time on Around the Wicket.